in the hours before being taken captive on the eve of Christ and his crucifixion, he talked to his disciples. Uh, we know that from, of course, from John uh, 13 on uh, for the, most of the, the remaining part of the book of John uh, about various things before, and during, and even after the Passover service that uh, explained to them some things. And in John 13, and you can turn there if you like, I'll just read the one verse. John 13, verse 33, he said, Little children, I shall be with you a little while longer. You will seek me, and as I said to the Jews, where I am going, you cannot come. So now I say to you. Now, so he was telling them that I'll be here just a, just a little while longer. And, of course, uh, it's sort of uh, like the trail of crumbs, you know, along the way uh, during his ministry, then his time with the disciples. He, he would, on occasion, talk about that, about the fact that he was going to be crucified and there would be an end to, to his ministry and not what they at first thought it was going to be. And really pretty much failed to understand all that time. So they had to be a little bit startled, again, for him there at the Passover service to say, I'm, I'm only going to be with you a short while longer. Well, what, what does that mean? And uh, they didn't understand that. And then he, he mentioned uh, something else that uh, was meant to encourage them, but they didn't understand that either, at least not, not entirely or certainly not understanding the time, and they, they thought he had come to free Judea from the dominance and the control of the Roman Empire, but that was not the case. So again, he shared some other words in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3, that was meant to encourage them, but also are meant for us to be encouraged by what he said then. And it's a bit different, of course, for our time. But he says in John chapter 14, verse 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many, many offices, many positions. If it were not so, I would have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, then I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So that, that came after, obviously, John 13, verse 33, where he said he was leaving, and they couldn't go with him, but he would come back, and they would be able to stay with him, so that wherever he is, they would, they would be there with him. So if they uh, connected the dots, so to speak, thought about one sentence and then the other one, then they would, you know, well, whatever Christ means, it's, it's going to be okay. But they didn't understand the time differential, certainly, about what was going to be involved there. But in John 14, there, verses 1 through 3, he, he talks, he says, first of all, believe. Believe me when I'm telling you these things. So accept that it will come to pass and that Christ will return. And God tells us the same today, that we are expected to maintain that confident belief that Christ will, in fact, return. And you and I are, uh, to uh, coin a phrase from an old TV station show that uh, at, least, uh, I'd say at least half the audience probably remembers, called You Bet Your Life a <laughs> uh, long time ago. Uh, that's what we are positioning our lives on in believing that Christ will return and that he tells them he will establish in different words there, he said, in my father's house there are many mansions, but he's promising that he's going to set up a kingdom and that they will be a part of it. They will be given an office and responsibility in that kingdom. And of course, today, Christ is still preparing that place. We heard about this a lot at the Feast of Tabernacles, and he's preparing a place with many mansions, many offices, many positions that he's going to share with his saints for those that endure to the end. So what are, what are the purposes for that, those offices? 
and what are they to be? Now, those are questions that all of us should be able to answer, but we'll go through a couple of scriptures to remind us. In Revelation chapter 5, Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Verse 9, and they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. Clearly talking about Christ. And you have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God. It, that's a, a statement of, it's a declarative statement, which again, God calls those things that are not as though they be. It, it's as good as done. If God says he's going to do it, he can speak of those things as if they're history. And we shall reign on the earth. So we understand we are going to be given positions as leaders, as rulers, as teachers over the earth and during the millennium, during the, the various peoples that, are, that survive and those that are born thereafter, we're going to have responsibility to actually reign on the earth. And he, he talks over in John chapter 5, John chapter 5, verses 25 through 30, what that reign entails. In verse 25 of John 5, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. They, they, both of them have uh, life to give, life to share, life inherent. And has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice, and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. And then he points out, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own, my own, own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. And so he's going to execute judgment. And a scripture that we're all familiar with many times, over in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, he talks about judgment, but Christ himself, himself will do, will execute judgment. He will be the King of kings and Lord of lords. But he tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, first three verses, in the middle of the of verse, uh, verse 1, Verse 2, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Now, Christ is going to judge the world on a macro basis. But he's telling us there that the saints will share in that judgment in his kingdom. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Of course, he's... he's uh, teaching them there is something they were having trouble with, and uh, he's he, saying they should not be going to courts. They should judge the matter in the church. But he points out then, do you not know that we shall judge angels? And to what degree, we, we can speculate in various ways, but at some point we are going to be responsible for judging angels to some degree or another. How much more things that pertain to this life that says that as, as Christians, you and I should be able to judge, make judgments relative to things in this life that you and I could be called on, perhaps by one of your brethren, we'll get into that later, to make a judgment. And of course, you're also, as we'll see, and get to the, the meat of the sermon, or to, the, to the body of it, that that uh, our judging is more, uh, should be more about ourselves first before we think about judging, judging others. He said, we, should, we are going to judge angels, so we should be able to judge things in this life. 
So, again, those scriptures just point out that our responsibility under Christ in the kingdom will be to be judges, to be kings, rulers of some, some, at some level, and to be able to pass judgment, render judgment in various circumstances where, there's, where there may be controversy, that we should be able to do that. And learning that, learning how to do that now is something you and I should be putting forth an effort to accomplish. And that think about judging individuals, judging cities, judging states to some level, who knows where God will end up, Christ will end up putting us in his kingdom. And he tells us something in Matthew chapter 23 that is the, I guess, the, was the catalyst for the, the sermon. Matthew 23, verse 23 he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. Of course, Christ is now being very blunt with the spiritual leaders of Judea at that point. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, and mercy, and faith. These you ought to have done without leaving the others undone. So the Pharisees, as we have heard many times and know and read, that they had documented and provided detailed rules, do's and don'ts, that for them, and their, their, their definition of righteousness, those rules and do's and don'ts uh, explained and clarified Righteousness, at least as it was in their eyes, and could, whether it be a Sabbath day's journey or a matter of exactly how to tithe as they did, they, they were tithing, or how often they fasted and how, how often was, was good to do, etc. The various things they put together. But if you notice what Christ said here. Now, he clearly stated that tithe, tithing should be done. He said, these things you ought to have done. So we know that tithing is important. It was not the first thing that Paul taught. He did not want to be uh, accused of being in the, the business of preaching the gospel for money. So, but he did teach it. It was not the first thing he taught. So it is important. If we, if we don't tithe, the Bible tells us in Malachi that we're robbing God. So this is not to... Uh, uh, improperly de-emphasized tithing. But Christ makes it a point here. He said that tithing then is a weighty, a weighty matter, serious matter, very important. But as I said, it wasn't the first thing that Paul taught, but he, Christ then says, but judgment, mercy, and faith are weightier matters. They are the spiritual matters that are important for us to consider. So faith is a weightier matter of the law. We will not, by the way, we will not get into that one today. It's, it's also a weightier matter of the law, which is a little bit incongruous, at least in, in the eyes of what the world teaches, is that law and faith are somehow totally disconnected because it's all about faith, not about obedience to law. But Christ says that, that faith is a weightier matter of the law. So a topic perhaps for another time. So interpreting some judgment and mercy being weightier matters of the law. I'd like to spend the rest of the time that we have, that I have for this afternoon on how judgment and mercy relate to each other and to the law. Because the points I've made here in the introduction is that we are promised that we're going to be given responsibility where we will have to make judgments. Now, I do realize that if we fulfill our duties here and, here and now in this life, that once we are made spirit beings, we're going to have the ability to make righteous judgment. But there are, these are things and principles that we need to inculcate into our lives even now. So these are fun, they're fundamental points that we're going to look, being a look at, nothing new. These are straightforward. 
But these are nonetheless, these are fundamental points of judgment and mercy that you and I have to consider in building into our lives now. As I mentioned earlier, that we have this responsibility to judge or make judgment in our own lives, that takes priority over maybe making judgment or weighing matters that may concern someone else. So we need to learn to judge ourselves. So I want to, in doing that, I'll, I'll draw your attention to an editorial that was given by Mr. Weston, written in a, a Living Church News, and this goes back a ways, to September, October edition in 2017, on what drives your decisions. Uh, maybe I could, you could retitle it almost, what, what drives your judgments? What, what, that, uh, how do you make these decisions? Of course, good decisions, as we know, bring good results, and so good decisions obviously are going to be tied to making good judgments. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, and uh, you don't need to turn there, just point out there that uh, we, most of us can uh, know, know that scripture, but it points out that Christ in us, Christ lives in us, and if Christ is living in us, then we should be able to rely on him to help to learn to make good judgments, good decisions, that the mind of Christ will enable good judgments. And maybe, as that's in it, first, first and foremost, that's about making judgments in our own lives. So in the, in the editorial on pages four and five, and some of these things uh, might be a little sensitive, uh, but he wrote it, I'm just quoting. Uh, but the good reminders, and I think they're good reminders, and, and, and part of the reason I, I've used this is these are things that, some of them, that we hear at least twice a year. Now, I know it's more than that, but at least twice a year, because we make certain announcements at the Feast of Tabernacles, and we make similar announcements in the spring at the Days of Unleavened Bread that have to do with the matters that, are, that we'll see here as, as we go through this. And this first section is clothing and modesty. And you think, oh, yes, here, here we go. <laughs> but it's relevant because even though some of us have grown up in the church, these things somehow still escape present mind or the present circumstance. And those of us that have been in the church for a long time, they're a little older, sometimes can do things that uh, uh, with the judgment may be, may be lacking. He writes, <clears throat> dress styles are, per are a perpetual challenge for the people of God. Scripture instructs women to dress modestly, but what is modesty? The Church of God has historically understood that there are cultural differences when it comes to dress, and that styles are in a state of constant change. It's a, uh, an obvious statement, an obvious reality in our world. But he writes later on, but the real issue is not a change in style, but whether that change reflects modesty and what is being promoted by the style. One might argue that the Bible doesn't explicitly condemn earrings on men in a direct command. But who was it in modern times that promoted this change in male behavior? Where did, where did it resume in this time to be acceptable? Who was it in modern times and should a Christian want to take part in it? You may want to read David Capellian's book on the marketing of evil if you don't know. Now, I dare say that there's a good number of our brethren right here who have that book. And even a gentleman who's not in the church wrote a very compelling book. And if you don't have it and you've not read it, please do. Please find a copy. Look it up. Again, a man who does not in the church, he was able to discern exactly how fashion and how the marketing programs that the world has for what it, what, what, what it wants to promote 
are obviously evil. And so a lot of what is pushed on the world, what is pushed on our society, is by those who simply want to make money. In the marketing of evil. The problem is, he writes, that we all the problem is that we all have different ideas of what is modest. Why? Why, if we all have the Spirit of God, are there so many differences? The Apostle Paul gives us a clue. Quote here, this is coming from Hebrews chapter 5. It says the, and writes, Of whom we have much to say, and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. Now, he's being pretty, pretty blunt with the Hebrews, with those Christians who had been in the church for a good while, who had been, many of whom were likely there on the day of Pentecost in 31 AD. You become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are full aged, that is, those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. By practicing good judgment and reading God's word, figure out what God, how, what Christ is thinking, and we learn to think as Christ thinks. And, and Mr. Weston has mentioned this many, many times that we need to have our senses exercised, we need to practice. The things big and little. We might think, well, style is one of the little things. Maybe it's one of the weighty things, but not one of the weightier things. But it's a matter of learning to make good judgments. It says clothes considered stylish by this world are often lacking in modesty. You know, we, typical words. You read the whole thing. It's talking about things that are too short, too tight, uh, too revealing. Uh, and we, we do mention, uh, again, regularly, at least twice a year, about the kind of what it's appropriate attire for the Sabbath and for the Feast of Tabernacles. And there are several things usually mentioned that not too short, not too tight, not too revealing, uh, no bare shoulders. Uh, I recall Mr. Weston mentioning one time that he wasn't even sure what spaghetti straps meant, what they are. But we've been said to not wear spaghetti straps. Uh, but the, for the Sabbath attire, in terms of dresses that are pretty much provide bare shoulders. And I don't mean to embarrass anyone that I don't think I have, I didn't see anyone like that today, but be it as it may. But those matters, if that's what the church teaches, that's what we should be sensitive to doing so that we are sure to cover ourselves properly for the ladies. And, you know, for the men, it talks about collared shirts. Now, I realize collared shirts are not uh, necessarily fashionable around the world. And those the various cultural differences come into play. But collared shirts. I, it's, I, I don't know that I've ever seen shirts that aren't collared uh, at Sabbath services, but it could be. Uh, but anyway, that, that's, that's there for the men to notice one way or the other. So... The, the question even, if we're, I think another example he mentions here, are pants, with, is it appropriate for ladies to wear pants to church? Because Mr. Meredith rendered a decision years ago that pants, a dressy pants suit was fine. But what we heard was pants are okay. And certainly there are times and re, there are legitimate reasons why pants can only be worn for some, some, some health, health matters. And, but the reality of what we wear to church comes under this huge umbrella of are we dressing up to honor God? We wear our best. And, you know, for anyone that's new, come to church new, should be able to look around and see what, what the church promotes. I can give you an example in a TWP in Florida. We had a gentleman show up. He had a ponytail down to his belt, had open collared or open button, unbuttoned shirt, and he was an older fellow, so you could see all the gray hairs. Uh, and very scruffy looking. 
uh, beyond what, you know, fashionable scruffy <laughs> today. I mean, just scruffy. And he comes up after the TWP and says, I want to come to church. And all I told him was, you sure you want to? You know, yeah, I want, I want to be part of the church. Then here's the information. And then I cautioned all the deacons, <laughs> do not, under any circumstance, make any reference to long hair, etc. And nothing was said to that gentleman ever. But four or five, six weeks, I'm not sure how long it was, he showed up with a haircut. He was able to look around and see, you know, ponytails are not in fashion in the living church of God. So a few weeks later, he showed up, he's clean shaven. Not this scruffy's a sin. There might be some, I'm sorry, but I uh, do have a little bit of scruff here. <laughs> but I can also remember the time when Popeye and, and Bluto <laughs> and the, and then the uh, Popeye cartoons, the only guy that had this deal was a sailor who was uh, in disdain. Now it's okay. But be that as it may, I, I, I digress. But a few weeks later, he showed up in a white shirt, all buttoned, and a tie. And before long, perhaps when he had enough time to buy one, he showed up in a sport coat, and he said, Mr. Strain, I want to get baptized. Our example to one another is important, but our example to those that may be new is also extremely important that we are here to honor God. And so these comments about attire should, should, in that sense, ring a bell for all of us, why we do these things, why we pay attention to those kinds of details is because we're being taught to honor our, our Creator. And these things, little as they may seem to some of us, are important. And Mr. Weston writes in, in, on page 5, we must learn to savor the things of God, not the things of man. And then he compares it to what we can see on TV, the kind of movies we may go see, and the things to which we get accustomed, perhaps, in seeing, and what is evil a year ago may not seem so bad today, or what was, let's say, more like what was evil 15 years ago may not seem so bad today because we've grown accustomed and things have gotten worse. What, what's really evil today is way beyond the pale when compared to what it was 15 or 20 years ago. And I think I've mentioned this before, but I, I cannot think about these things without about the sermonette that I heard when I was in college where the, 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 the minister made the point that if the train is going the wrong way, it doesn't matter whether we are right behind the engine or we jump on with the caboose, and the train might be 15 years long. If the train is going the wrong way, you're still going the wrong way. Just because you've gotten, we've gotten used to it doesn't make it right. And so we have to be aware that the world is, go is descending and we do not want to descend incrementally with it. We're just a little behind the times in the ways of the world. He points out there's always been a desire on the part of members to think in terms of what's right, what's wrong, is it okay or not okay? And he points out that the question, is it okay, is simply not the right word or the right question. Is it the wise thing to do? Is it the good thing? Is, is it what Christ would do? Are we learning to think like Christ? This requires not, a, not an ever-ending list of do's and don'ts, but a mind that discerns, that savors the way Christ thinks, what, what Christ would choose to do. So we can think in terms of long hair. When I was in high school, the Beatles had long hair. And those of us that wanted to be rebels, I did not, thankfully, but let their hair grow to see whether or not the school would allow it. Today, long hair is, has different meanings to people. 
They certainly apply to us. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Verses 31 and 32, Paul writes, If we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, if we, if we do the job well ourselves, we are examining ourselves. We are checking our conduct, our attitudes, our activities. Then... Be, it's, that much better. We would not be judged. But when we are judged, when God has to intervene, and he does on occasion, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. So occasionally God has to intervene. And we are judged. We are tried in various ways to help us have better discernment of what is good and maybe what, what's not so good. So we have to do that, and we have to do these things by studying God's Word, by the examples of those around us. Again, in the, the point of the sermonette, that our time together, that we are encouraging each other in our conduct. And by the way, that, uh, just a comment, it's, uh, I did not know what Mr. Lee was going to be giving the sermon in on when I wrote my little note yesterday afternoon. Uh, they do tie together, and, but the point of the sermon was much better made. <laughs> uh, and that, just, that God wants us to, to learn to judge these things. And this, this, if you will, the fellowship, the opportunity to fellowship uh, is important. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, not a matter of sin to not be there certainly, but a matter of doing something that is the wise thing to do. We learn to, learn to have righteous judgment on ourselves. So what does the Bible say then about judging others? And some of these points clearly apply to this first point in how we would judge others, that we could also turn these into, into scriptures to use about ourselves. Let's turn back to Deuteronomy chapter 17. Deuteronomy 17, once in a while, as ministers, we get lucky. We just turn back to the page we need. <laughs> One fell swoop. But uh, Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 14 and 15. When you come to the land which the eternal your God is giving you and possess it, and you dwell in it, and you say... I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. So here's a prophecy. <laughs> this is, God, God knew this was going to happen at some point, that the, this, this much of the influence of the other nations around them were going to get the Israelites to want a king. They were going to absorb certain of their ways of life. And you shall surely then, if you, when that happens, you'll set a king over you whom the eternal your God chooses. One from among your brethren you shall set as king over you. You may not set a foreigner over you who is not your brother. So clear stipulation there. Had to be an Israelite. Then over in, in verse 18, here's what the king will do. And this shall be when he sits on the throne of his kingdom that he shall write for himself a copy of this law in a book from the one before the priest, the Levites. So, you know, we, we have Bibles. Uh, uh, I dare say that very likely that every member has more than one Bible in their home. We have multiple Bibles, multiple translations we check on, in our studies. Not so in ancient Israel, that documents were very precious commodities. And the documents about God's word were very much, uh, very precious. And the priest had them, the Levites had them, but the common Israelite, the average Israelite did not. So the king didn't have one, but when the man became king, then he's going to make a copy 
an official copy. He's he going to borrow one from the priest, and he's going to write a copy. Very careful to make it exact. And it shall be with him, because writing it out, first of all, puts it in your mind. Uh, writing it down, not keyboarding it, but writing it down. It's why we take notes. And it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life. There will be enough there. He probably can't memorize it. One could. There are people who have phenomenal memories and can pull it up in, 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 uh, on a moment's notice. But he'll read it. He'll study it all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the eternal his God and be careful to observe all the words of this law and these statutes. So we're going to read it daily to make sure he's familiar with all of the various articles that God has commanded. And in verse 20, that his heart may not be lifted above his brethren. If he's busy judging himself by those commandments, he's not going to think too highly of himself and, and condemning his, his, his brethren, that he may not turn aside from the commandment to the right hand or to the left, that he may prolong his days in his kingdom, he and his children in the midst of Israel. So he was going to have to study this on a regular basis. He wasn't sufficient just to have a copy. It's not sufficient for us just to have own a Bible. And I remember in years past on, on the world tomorrow uh, broadcast and then telecast, the challenge was to get the Bible off your table and dust it off, <laughs> implying it had been unused long enough to gather dust. No, we use our Bibles. We study them on a regular basis. That's what the king was to do. We have our own copy, multiple copies today, the entire Bible, not just the book of the Deuteronomy, because it could have been that he, he was expected to write all, all five books, but especially the law written, given in Deuteronomy. But many of the statutes and judgments are in other parts of the first five books, in the book of Exodus and the book Leviticus, also in Numbers, some of them. We'll mention those in just, in just a minute. But he was to, to study these things and know them. And let's turn over to 2 Samuel chapter 8. Second Samuel chapter 8. And this all comes under this matter of the, the ways of learning to make good judgment. The first point was simply know the law. Why do we study? Why do we read? Why did the king have to write these things out and read them daily? It was so he would know what the statutes were, what the commandments said, what to enforce. And here in 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 14, talking about David after his military victories, verse 14, he also put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became David's servants. And the Eternal preserved David wherever he went. This is the point where he was coming to a certain, having a certain amount of peace as, as in his latter years. So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered judgment and justice to all his people. To do that, David very likely was reading his copy, the book of the law, hopefully on a daily basis, for him to do this, to administer judgment and justice to all his people. Where he could listen to controversies, and he could make decisions and render judgment fair to those that were appealing to him on those matters. In Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 97 Psalm 119 is not, not noted at the beginning of, of, the, of the psalm as being written by David. He may, may, may have, or may be a composite, but these words certainly apply to the kind of man David was. In verse 97 through verse 100, Oh, how I love your law! It's my meditation all the day. You, through your commandments, make me wiser than my enemies, for they are ever with me. 
So a constant companion. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep your precepts. So the matter of knowing the law, having it well in mind, one of the things that we have to do. And then in Psalm 96, Psalm 96, verse 10. would apply to us. Say among the nations, the eternal reigns. The world also is firmly established. It shall not be moved. He shall judge the peoples righteously. If Christ is going to do that, and he's going to do that administer, administration of the world through the saints, then we're going to be part of those, some of those who render righteous judgments who are familiar with the testimonies, who are familiar with the statutes, as well as the Ten Commandments. And I'm just going to give you a list of, the, of some of the sections you can read. I'm going to go through all of these, but uh, in Exodus chapter 20, of course, the Ten Commandments, and on chapter 20 through 24, it talks about statutes and judgments as well. Leviticus 19 and 20, a couple of chapters. Numbers 35 and 36, Deuteronomy 25, uh, there you have several days of Bible study right there laid out for you, <laughs> for all of us. But those, those chapters, how often do we read them? To put the mind of Christ, who was the God of the Old Testament, he was the one who was the person that led Israel out of Egypt, the one that was with them in the cloud and in the fire at night. His mind was rendered through these judgment. Now, I think it's interesting to compare God's laws with man's laws. Why do we have appellate courts at, I'm not even sure how many levels there are, <laughs> civil, you know, state and state laws and local laws and federal laws, we finally go to a Supreme Court, someone, some group of individuals who can render the judgment about laws. But there are hundreds of thousands, and I dare say millions of laws, many of which are contradictory, many of which are decades and centuries old, and sometimes a smart lawyer can find one that's ancient, and not, not one aware of it and, and can win a case. When God's laws are not in the millions. God's laws are understandable. Some of men's laws go out of date. God's laws do not ever go out of date. Certain things are eternal. Man's laws are difficult to implement, but God's aren't. So point number two. If we're going to render righteous judgment, we're going to have to learn to obey and fear God. Let's turn back to Exodus 18, which is a familiar account when the government, the human instruments of the government of Israel was set up. Some standards were given. Exodus chapter 18 Verse 21 and the very, very first part of verse 22. And Moses being given advice on how to do this and choosing the ones that are going to be part of the government. says, moreover, you shall select from all the people able men, individuals that have, that have capability, men of talent, hating covetousness and place such over them to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And I omitted here that talks about such as fear God and men of truth, men who also understand right and wrong, men who understand what God expects of the other, of the, the Israelites. 
and who are not going to be subject to covetousness and they can be trusted, entrusted with the authority that goes with it. And then in the very first part of verse 22, and let them judge the people at all times. Of course, he goes on to point out some things are, need to be escalated and need to be appealed. Then they, after going through the uh, levels there, up to a thousand, thousand families, that then they could go to Moses to render a final decision. So there are four qualifications there. They had to be uh, men of truth. They had to understand right and wrong. And all of the things that are listed there in that one verse, verse, verse 21, in fact apply to the other matters that we're going to go through as well. In Isaiah chapter 26, or 66, verse 2, talks about someone not being over others in a wrong way. In Isaiah 66, verse 2, points out of him who is poor and of a con contrite spirit, and who trembles at my word. So men of humility, the men that had proper perspective about themselves. So learning to fear God, learning to recognize their whatever position they might have, that nonetheless they were standing in place of the government that God had put in place in through Moses, and they had to be careful about how they rendered those things, how they made the decisions. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, of course, Paul is writing here about the qualifications for someone being ordained into the ministry. And this would apply for apply to us today, as well as indirectly. It certainly it applied. He was talking about men of truth, feared God. They, this would apply to them as well. But verse six, of First Timothy chapter three, not a novice, lest being puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. So someone that's that new in the faith is not a candidate to be ordained into the ministry. In ancient Israel, that I would imagine for those that were over 50, let's say, uh, certain, certain abilities, those that were over 1,000 families, that they were exceptional men. Be given that, that much responsibility, and they weren't new to the faith. They understood what was expected of them. Perhaps they spent time uh, with uh, the priest that had been chosen. Uh, don't know how, how, how they, was they were chosen necessarily, but someone who understood right from wrong and able to make those kinds of decisions. And over in, T in Titus, again, Paul writing to Titus about how to conduct himself, and this would apply to the men of ancient Israel, as well as those that God chooses today. In Titus chapter 2, verse 7, he's talking, exhorting Titus, in all things, showing yourself to be a pattern of good works, dependably conducting himself as a servant of God and, and a Christian. In doctrine, showing integrity, reverence, and incorruptibility, not willing to bend any of the major teachings of what would define the church of God and what would define God's people. So knowing the law first, then knowing the law, obeying the law, and fearing God as you study it and as you live your life and conducting yourself appropriately. All right. Third point, impartiality. A judge to be impartial. Let's turn back to Proverbs 24. As I mentioned, some of these, some of these rules, some of these qualifications, are pretty obvious. But depending on the circumstances, 
that one might find oneself in, sometimes practicing them may not be so easy. But here being, he tells us to be impartial. Proverbs 24, verses 23 through 26. These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. He who says to the wicked, you are righteous, him the people will curse and nations will abhor him. But those who rebuke the wicked will have delight and a good blessing will come upon them. That it, then verse 26, he who gives a right answer kisses the lips. It's a, a metaphor for receiving homage and respect from others. That people who render righteous judgment, the right answer, are going to be respected. And it's not good to show partiality. In Leviticus 19, Leviticus 19, just one verse here, simple statement, but it brings some clarity and expansion, if you will, to the, to the point of being impartial. Leviticus 19, verse 15, you shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor. But he, sometimes when people went through all this, uh, show partiality because someone needs the decision rendered. Nor honor the person of the mighty because someone's wealthy or because they have a great responsibility. How much more difficult it is for the government to, to try someone who's in public office because they have authority, they have, or they have money, uh, individuals that are wealthy, than it is to try someone who doesn't have any money. The ones who don't have any money get a, an attorney appointed by the court. Someone who's wealthy can go out and hire the best. And a, uh, an acquaintance of mine made some, a comment in my presence one time that uh, talking about a, a matter of, that he had, he had given advice to someone about what to do, and he says, go get the meanest attorney you can find in town. That was what the recommendation was, because the person could afford, I guess, to get the meanest and maybe the best known lawyer in town to try to defend their case. But we read in James chapter 2, in James chapter 2, He says, don't, don't be partial. He clarifies it, and I won't read all of it, but if you read verses 1 through 10 of James chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, I read those, but the, the ver verse 8 verses show the context. But if you show partiality, you commit sin. And are convicted by the law as transgressors. Whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point is guilty of all. So partiality, showing partiality, is sin. So if we're going to be righteous judges, then we cannot be, be partial for any reason whatsoever. And part of that, partiality can be influenced. In Deuteronomy chapter 16, this is point number four. Deuteronomy chapter 16, verses 18 through 20. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates, which the eternal your God gives you according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with just judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, which I just mentioned. But points also here, nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. You shall follow what is altogether just, that you may live and inherit the land which the eternal your God is giving you. So the purpose of a bribe obviously is to... to create partiality, to make someone obligated to render a judgment 
in that person's favor. But God points out directly here that to not take any, any, any sense of, of a bribe. And back in chapter 10, verses 17 through 19, Deuteronomy 10, verse 17, For the eternal your God is a God of gods, and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality, nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow, and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. So even there, someone who is a stranger, who is an immigrant, who is a foreigner, sometimes could be rendered an unfavorable judgment simply because of who they are, where they came from. There could be any, any number of reasons where what the one is rendered is partial for that reason, but points out again that partiality should not be there and when one should not take bribes because God is very concerned about those who are defenseless those who don't have a way to take care of themselves or, or provide for themselves. All right, point number five. Point number five. Let's turn over to Proverbs 18. Whenever there is a dispute, whenever there is a controversy, one must be sure in order to render a just judgment, one must be sure to hear the entire matter, the entire matter. Proverbs 18, verse 17. The first one to plead his cause seems right until his neighbor comes and examines him. So presents the other side of the story. And it may not be that one person is lying, but Two different observations of what, matter of fact, may be, may be fact, but two different views, two different impressions that are possibly affected by the emotions of the moment. So we have to hear the whole matter. So uh, you know, if you, uh, I think standard fare, you know, if someone comes to the ministry with a complaint about someone else, then the, one of the first things they hear is, you, you do realize I'm only hearing one side. I cannot say anything about this one way or the other. What you say seems good, seems right, but I have to hear the other side. I have to hear the whole matter. So render both sides. It says in Proverbs 18, just to maybe just across the page, verse 13. He who answers a matter before he hears it is folly and shame to him. So if as judges we don't want to be viewed as being irresponsible and shameful conduct, we're going to listen to the whole story. So that includes listening to both sides of the controversy. A righteous judge must listen to both sides, both accounts, in order to make a fair and equitable judgment. And as I mentioned earlier, but these things are pretty, pretty obvious. And one might think that's, that's easy. Unless you're ever called, ever called upon to render a judgment. And there is a scripture we'll refer to in a moment about this that uh, perhaps some of you have been. And uh, but others may hope that they never are. But the big point, another big point, point number six, is the judge must ask God for wisdom and discernment. Wisdom and discernment. We know, I'll just refer to a couple of scriptures here, that Solomon, when he was made the king, he dreamed and God spoke to him, said, what, what, would I, what do you want? What can, you, can I give you? And Solomon asked for wisdom. And God gave him 
the wisdom. Descript, described it as none like that, that came before or after. So at the height of his kingship and administration, he was one of a kind and outstanding. And God, of course, God's response was he gave him wisdom and a lot of other things as well. But he asked God for wisdom and for judgment and ability to, he said, I'm a, I'm a little child. I can't go in. I don't know how to go in and come out or whatever. So please give me the wisdom I need to judge your great people. And today we learn that and certainly the responsibility in God's kingdom to judge his people as well. James in chapter, chapter 1, James chapter 1 says that if we lack wisdom, we should ask God. Verse 5, and that he gives this without reproach. He gives us an abundance. He is the source of wisdom. We need to ask God for that if we're going to be responsible and render proper judgment. And let's turn back to Matthew 18. And I'll just make a couple of comments about this, frankly. In Matthew chapter 18, because we often refer to this account, in verses 15 through 17, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, Matthew 18, 15, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. And notice what it says. It says there that if your brother sins against you. I mean, that, right, that word sins, it, it, it rises to the level of just more than an unkind word. <laughs> more than uh, saying something hurts your feelings. This is someone that has done you wrong, whether it's a slander, they've libeled you, accused you unjustly, spread rumors that needs to be, that need to be rectified, that, that's wrong. But if they're just in conversation, they say something that's, uh, if you find that was a little bit insulting, that's not what Matthew 18 is referring to here in verse 15. But if someone sins against you, go to your brother. If he doesn't hear you, you take two or three witnesses. If he doesn't hear two or three witnesses, then take it to the church. Go to the ministry for resolution. But when you pick those two or three people to help you to render the matter, judge the matter, we can't pick our friends. <laughs> we can't pick someone who doesn't understand the controversy. You go back to, you look at your particular reference here. This goes back to Leviticus 19, verse 17, also Deuteronomy 17, that clearly the, the instruction is we are to pick individuals who understand the controversy, they understand the, the problem, and that they are men of truth. Because it could be that the ones you pick will tell you you're wrong. <laughs> that the other person is the one that, uh, that they didn't really sin against you, it just perceived. So we have to, in going to, to Matthew 18, pick the right time or the right, the right controversy, it would apply, but to do it, to do it carefully. So those are, those are the six, six points about that, in terms of knowing the law and all, all of those items. But there's one left over from the, even the title of the sermon, was righteous judgment and mercy. And mercy comes into play. It is a matter of the law. In Proverbs chapter 16, and I dare say that we have no, no doubt that mercy plays into the law because we, we, if we sin, then we want, and our, we repent, we want God to show mercy. In Proverbs 16, verse 6, in terms of incenting one to change, in verse 6, he says, In mercy and truth, someone made aware of a, perhaps a misunderstanding, or a reminder of what they know to be true, but they've not 
obeyed it. In mercy and truth, atonement is provided for iniquity. So the mercy says the iniquity is set aside because the truth is, is applied. And by the fear of the eternal, one departs from evil. We understand that God is going to judge us, and we do not want to be judged by him, so we work on changing. In Romans chapter 2, verse 4, Romans 2, verse 4, Paul writes, Do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance, and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance? God's long-suffering and mercy should then incent us to change. There are times we realize we have our, our shortcomings. And there is no zap from heaven. God gives us time to reconcile and judge ourselves and so to see if we will simply respond to his word, respond to a sermon, respond to a counseling. And if we do, then God give forgiveness upon a repentance. He's very patient. He does react when it's called for. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. The Father of mercies, that is God's nature. God wants to forgive. He loves mercy. Something that we come to should come to love. And being merciful is counter to our human nature. It's counter to the, the influences of Satan. To be merciful, to be forgiving, to be truly forgiving, to try to forget the indiscretions and sins of someone else. So we to be like God. In Psalm 103, verse 8, I'll read this. It said, The Lord, or the Eternal, is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in mercy. Psalm 103, verse 8. Now we know that on occasion, God does intervene. He does judge. And yet, even as he judges, he shows mercy. And perhaps David is the, the classic case for that. David's sin with Bathsheba and the murder of Uriah. By law, death was required for that. And yet God forgave those sins, and death was not required. David was not stoned. Nathan told him, you know, God has set aside your sin. Now, David didn't get away unscathed. For the remainder of his life, he dealt with very, very difficult problems, very great challenges. But God showed the mercy, and the mercy comes into play when someone is willing to correct their wrong. Then we forgive. God forgives. In Matthew 18, if someone sins against us, and we go to them and they apologize, we've won our brother. And then it's up to the onus at that point. The onus is on a, upon us to be willing to forgive. James chapter 2, verse 13. James chapter 2, verse 13. It shows God's priority, sense of priority. James 2, verse 13. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Scripture, the, way, the ideas that we talk a lot about at Passover time, prior to Passover. But judgment without mercy to the one who does that is shown no mercy. And then it points out here that mercy triumphs over judgment. There is a time to forgive. 
in learning to practice and exercise mercy in judgment. He's learning to be and think like God, like Jesus Christ. He tells us in Matthew 18 that we should be willing to forgive 70 times 7. Uh, boy, <laughs> that's a big one. <laughs> uh, I'll just mention, where could that ever happen? That someone 490 times would offend you and you'd say it's okay, <laughs> don't worry. I think we might decide that's not my buddy. <laughs> uh, need to stay away from him or her. But where does it happen? Where might it happen? 70 times 7 in our families. Those that are closest to us. It can happen over and over and over. And yet in our family, God willing, and hopefully that's the case, that we say it's okay. You, know, you move, we move on. Seventy times seven, but God, Christ says we have to be willing to do that because we want to be shown mercy, something we have to learn in this life. So as a part of the family of God existing on the God plane level, we're going to practice these things. We want to learn them in this life, to rehearse. Know the law. Study the law. Obey the law. Render judgment that's impartial. Make sure we're rendering it on the facts, not on factors that are irrelevant. Never allow ourselves to be bribed into partiality or an unrighteous judgment. Hear the whole matter. Make sure we hear both sides. Listen to the complete story. Get all the facts before judgment's made. And then important for all of us to remember to always beseech God to give us wisdom to make righteous judgment. Give us insight, give us discernment. And then lastly, if we're going to be and savor the things of Jesus Christ in the mind of Jesus Christ and God the Father, then we're going to learn to be merciful and patient and kind and forgiving. God himself, God the Father, is the Father of mercies. In being part of his family, then we want to be doing the same thing.